สวัสดีครับพอมพูดภาษาไทยมาได้ครับ <laughs> so I was speaking English I hope you bear with me and please let me start first of all by thanking อาจารย์ปานุพงศ์นิติประภา for inviting me for delivering this keynote speech today uh, it's a great honor for me Uh, to be here, what an impressive symposium that is, and it's especially a delight because um, FES, in the context of the Economy of Tomorrow project, which I will present to you right now, is already closely cooperating uh, with uh, the Faculty of Economics of the Tamasat University. You're a very close partner to me. I especially have to uh, thank Ajahn Bokpong Yunvit, uh, who is not here today. But uh, he brought many fresh talents to the table, and it's good to see that there is an institution in Thailand that has so much brain power and can deliver so much uh, thinking. I have to say, I'm humbled to speak of uh, in front of a group of such distinguished and achieved economists. Um, as you saw uh, by my own resume, I'm not even an economist myself. So I try to find a little bit of confidence in the fact that the Uh, facts and the ideas and the analysis that I will present today is based um, on the ideas and analysis of more than 120 economists, philosophers, and political scientists from Asian and European countries. Uh, but to be quite honest, I think the reason why I'm here um, is because I told a joke to Ajahn Banupong last time I saw him when we were talking about populism. Uh, and I said, uh, well, you know, populism is very similar to terrorism. Uh, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. And uh, I think this is pretty much the same with populism. It's really in the eye of the beholder. So listen up, young economists. If you ever want to deliver a keynote speech, you have to work on your sense of humor, I guess. Um, but what's funny, um, on the first hand, maybe a little bit more serious if you think about it. Uh, the question is, um, how can a democratic society um, seriously um, determine its direction without any backroom deals that we're not aware of, but really in a de uh, democratic sense, if the two main camps cannot agree on anything? And I think what we see right now in the United States um, pretty much speaks to that problem. Yeah? What do you do if you have a deadlock? Um, secondly, how can the public, both the media and as well the, uh, the, the ordinary citizens, come to an informed judgment if they are lacking all the knowledge, the millions of facts uh, that you would actually have to know in order to be uh, able to have an informed judgment on these uh, highly complex economic problems? I believe what you need is a framework um, that pretty much puts together all these complicated uh, little technical tasks that are so important, the details, into a grand picture. You need a compass that basically speaks to your grandmother on the kitchen table, as well as the export community that has to tackle all these complicated questions. So before I get into uh, determining um, what all that means, so just a quick reminder that I think you already have a PowerPoint presentation in front of you, so you don't have to take notes. And outside, you can take Uh, the manifest of the economy of tomorrow, which is basically, like I said, uh, the outcome of uh, these um, determinations of more than 100 economists from Asia. So um, I'm going to divide my speech into three parts. Um, normally, I always uh, get to uh, a speech assignment, and they say, you have 20 minutes. Can you do it in 10? Uh, this time, I have a lot of time, so hopefully you bear with me. So basically, the three parts will be number one, talking about the challenges and the problems. Uh, why is a new development path actually necessary? So of course, I'm thankful for the introduction of uh, Ajahn Panupong, who already pointed out a couple of the problems uh, from an economist's point of view. I like to add to that maybe from other disciplines, uh, because I think the problems that we see are not irrational, but they are part of a big and comprehensive crisis. Uh, and I think understanding these interlinkages means that uh, also economists and other disciplines really have to work closely together in order to understand that. Um, secondly, I would like to propose um, a model, uh, an economic model for socially just, sustainable, and green dynamic growth. So that's basically the academic 
answer, the answer of the economists, the many new challenges that we are seeing. And in the third uh, chapter, I would like to talk about politics. Because I think we all know, and there's many senior economists here, and I think you have come up with many good ideas and research papers and policy proposals in your life. And I would not be surprised if you have not seen too many of them implemented. So the question is why? Uh, why is it so complicated if we agree on what should be done? Why is it so complicated to get it really done? So, I, as I said already, um, the crisis that we see is complicated, complex, and comprehensive. Um, because I'm a Farang today, I'm going to be polite and I'll talk about the crisis of the West. And I think it will be in your judgment to decide how many of the problems uh, that you see here on this table also apply to your societies in Asia and especially to Thailand. Um, but let's talk about the grace crisis of the West. I cannot go into all the details, but I think um, we all agree that there is many layers of that crisis, and I try to put that into the image of an onion that you can peel away. On the outset, we talked about uh, the euro crisis and the sovereign debt crisis a lot. I think I do not have to get into this. Later on, I will take this example, though, to show how intrinsically interlinked politics and analysis really is. Uh, the euro crisis is really a telling example about that. Then we have what I call the crisis of casino capitalism, financial capitalism, uh, basically what you see going on in the financial market. Uh, I don't have to tell you so much about this, you are economists, but I think we all have, know that um, this has a lot to do with uh, many institutions being terribly over leveraged and uh, basically it's like uh, that, you know, that game Jenga Towers, Jenga Towers, when everything becomes very unstable. I think this was the situation in 2008, and I would argue today it may be even worse. Um, that all adds to a crisis of what I call shareholder capitalism. I'm going to get into this um, right away. And there's many other layers, the, the failure of neoliberalism, um, I have to engage you as economists, and I'm sure there's many neoclassical economists, maybe all of you, I'm not sure, um, and in this room, um, what are actually the intrinsic flaws of that theory? Um, I think we have to dig very deep um, into the metaphysical roots um, of this theory in order to find out. There are limits to extractive growth. This is, I think, maybe the most relevant point for an Asian perspective. Um, there is a crisis of the nation state. Um, both in the center and in the periphery. Um, basically, you see the end of the nation state in Europe right now. Um, there is a crisis of representative democracy. Bad news, you're trying to build a, a function democracy and we, we see that our model is antiquated already. So I think we have to come together and think about how we can build a democracy for the 21st century. And in the middle of that is what I call a metaphysical black hole. Um, basically a crisis of the very foundations of this uh, historical crisis uh, cycle which we call modernity, um, which in the very latest fashion started with enlightenment and the very idea about man. Um, but let me uh, start with the economic problems first. Um, there can an argument be made that in the last 40 years, basically after the end of Bretton Woods, um, you didn't see any real growth in the West anymore, but you, you saw what you may call simulated growth, virtual growth. Um, basically, it was a, um, a cycle um, of problems, quick fixes, which created new problems, and they were all solved by what you call the injection of virtual resources, basically capital from the future. Um, think about what happened in the 1970s. We take the example of the US right now, it wouldn't look that different if you look to Europe, actually. Um, basically, you had um, the cancellation of the social contract of post-war, uh, of the post-war West. Uh, the, the social contract of the post-war West was basically to say, we keep capitalism as a system, a market economy based on private uh, property, but 
the deal is that we improve constantly improve the living conditions, the life chances of the po uh, majority of the population, which means social security, which means a rising real wages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That was cancelled in the late 1970s under um, what you call today neoliberalism, and uh, you had a strengthening of the accumulation of capital. Basically, capital was freed from all the many social and political constraints that were imposed on it in the post-war period, uh, which led to a basic problem, I think, which we're going to see later. Uh, I think you, what, what this model produces is a serious lack of aggregate demand. In order to fix that, there were several attempts basically political ones, and that's why I say it's important to, to see these interlinkages. Um, the political will was to say we have to keep the social peace. We have to at least pretend uh, to stay in the social contract, which means that we have at least to pretend there is the creation of wealth. So what, what happened basically in the 1970s is that you had um, moderate inflation, which created this sense of wealth, which of course um, basically got out of control in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, you had the intervention of the Fed, which I call a quick fix. So they were purging out uh, inflation by high interest, um, which created, again, massive unemployment. Uh, this unemployment was uh, basically trying to be tackled with the injection of another virtual capital, public debt. Uh, so you see the explosion of public debt, state debt um, in the US, uh, which then led to the public debt crisis in the 1990s. Um, here comes the Clinton administration with another quick fix. Uh, and They tried to, to balance the budget and slow down the growth of public debt, which again led to a problem with consumption demand because basically people got poor. Um, so then you had to enable them to access the financial markets capital themselves, basically, which was the credit card um, uh, the explosion of private debt. And the explosion of private debt, again, led then to what we saw um, later in its most extreme form to the subprime crisis. Uh, so there was a meltdown of that model. And what is the answer today? Quantitative easing. Yeah. So basically, you're printing money. So it's another virtual resource that you put into the cycle. So again, on the economic side, you have a problem, you have a quick fix, it creates another problem, and the solution is to inject virtual resources. Uh, these are cycles that usually run between uh, around 10 years each. So basically, um, the findings of this Economy of Tomorrow project is, is a three-fold one, and I'm not going to go into all this. Um, if you have a model which is based on neoliberal premises, um, which basically strengthens the supply side, supply side economics. You do have a problem with aggregate demand, and this aggregate demand problem is trying to be fixed. Um, I just uh, uh, went into uh, the creation of debt, uh, so that, that's one of the policy responses to that. Uh, another one is the German or Japanese model, is that you basically depend on exports. Um, and, uh, of course, um, that creates bubbles. So what, what I'm trying to say is um, that there is an inherent instability. There is imbalances that need to happen. The financial crisis was not an accident, but it's systemic, and it will be repeated uh, in the future. So like I said, we have to dig a little deeper to see why the systems are so unstable and why there are so many intertwined crises at the same time. And this is why I would invite you to go back with me to the very foundations of all the modern institutions that we here see today. Usually we discuss market versus state. I would say all of these institutions, the market, the state, and democracy are all based on a modernist ideal a modernist ideal which says, number one, that man can emerge from its self-imposed change, which means we are rational human beings which can overcome all challenges by this very rationality, and that eternal progress is possible, that we can 
better our living conditions more and more and more. And if you go, if you, if you dig into these foundations, uh, into the, the, the roots uh, of these trees of our institutions, you see all the things that we all cherish so much. Yeah? And uh, I think we, we have an intrinsic feeling that we don't want to touch them. Huh? But there is, of course, the homo economicus, uh, which I think is basically the basis uh, of all economics. Uh, um, but you also have the informed and the rational voter. Um, you have uh, things like state planning, the very technocrat idea that you can foresee problems, find rational solutions, fix them. If you can't fix them, you evaluate and go back. So the very way we see the world, we uh, tackle the world, is based on this idea of rationality of man. Well, what happened with social sciences in the last 60 years, they're all telling us it's not true. It started with Freud, who basically took, uh, told you that most of the stuff we do is actually driven by, by, you know, uh, by drivers that, that are beyond your control, psychological ones. The linguists tell you that you don't even understand your own language. The deconstructivists tell you that the social reality right now is a construct that is beyond your control. Um, the, the catastrophes of the 20th century, starting with the Second World War, all the way to Fukushima, tell you that planning maybe is sometimes not such a good idea, that there are things beyond our control. So I could add on that, but I think you get the, the general idea is that the idea that we are rational human beings, this kind of eternal being that makes its decision with full information based on self-interest and, of course, looking to the public good as well, the common good, I think is a fiction. So if at the very root of all the institutions that we have is a fiction, isn't what we see today basically the breaking in of reality that brushes away this kind of fiction? So you can, of course, dismiss all that and say, What's that to do with us? That's the crisis of the West. None of that is true for Asia. We have 30 years of stable double-digit growth here. Uh, this is the Asian century. Um, the West is declining. Eh? Um, I think I see in your eyes that you wouldn't be so, uh, so sure about that. But I would uh, make the, the following um, thesis, is that basically why the situation between Asia and the West is still different in many regards, I think the trajectories are converging. You see increasingly more of these problems that I just pointed out also in the societies here, which is, I think, the platform for a discussion and a conversation that we have with each other. Um, however, there is additional problems um, that advanced economies don't face in that way, and which is, of course, the problem of development. Uh, in the first stage, and then what I would say going to uh, the next stage of development. Um, not all of you believe in a middle income trap, but basically, what do you do when you reach a certain level, uh, as Thailand did right now, being an upper middle income country? Um, is it possible to continue on the same path, or do you have to shift gear? Um, that may be the question that is an additional one uh, for Asia. So let's dig a little bit deeper into that and start at the roots again. And look at the simplified development model that was so successful in East Asia, I would say. We're not so sure about South Asia, but I think in East Asia you have this kind of development model, um, which is a triangle between catch-up, industrialization, a heavy export dependency, and cheap labor. So what happens is basically um, many problems. Uh, Ajahn Panupong already pointed out many of them. But uh, basically, um, on the industrialization angle, you have the limits of extractive growth, which means uh, you have a, a, a shortage of resources, especially energy resources. Um, you have, of course, the problems of climate change. I think if you think about the flood uh, two years ago, you know how much damage uh, something like that had been done, and it, that didn't even start yet. So climate change will be a, a limit to extractive growth, the ecological limit, as I would call it later. Um, on the export, of course, you have all the, and I, if you remember that chart that uh, John Panupong just put in, you, and the, the two 
big dips, 2008 and 2009 and, and last year, basically that is due to external factors. Yeah? So um, the, the uh, vulnerability to external shocks, maybe a Japanese tsunami, what happens if in China the real estate bubble really pops um, the financial crisis, I mean, we're just talking about a default uh, in the US. Um, let's, I mean, of course, the, the short-term consequences would be a disaster anyway, but even the long-term consequences of a prolonged recession in the West uh, will create a problem for export markets in the long run. So um, then you have, you know, defending the BART, not defending the BART, volatility of the BART, uh, what does it mean for competitiveness of the export industry? So you have this, this kind of imported volatility is the vulnerability to external factors, and this is uh, what Ajahn Banupong already mentioned. Um, it's an unbalanced economy, basically. Um, but also on the wage front, there is problems. Um, I will not go into the red-yellow conflict and what that has to do with the social divide. Um, but um, I think the basic argument would be say, number one, if you want to get out of the middle income trap, you will have to increase productivity. How are you going to do that if you have a low wage economy? Where is the incentives? Where is the incentives to invest in machinery and better, uh, uh, better organization, et cetera, et cetera? So there is, there is a lack of incentives. And of course, for Thailand, special problem, start of the ASEAN economic community next year you're going to be in a direct competition with very low wage economies. Yeah? So how are you going to tackle that if you stay there? So I think the only way out is moving up the value chain, uh, but that has to be organized. Just to sum up, um, basically the argument is that extractive growth, the way you saw it over the last 30 years, cannot continue forever, neither here in Asia nor in the West, because there are limits. Um, the ecological ones, the fiscal ones, the social ones, the political ones, and the economic ones. So, now I'm scared to produce results. <laughs> the economists uh, are gearing up to answer, but I will try to give you some uh, economic solutions. Uh, the economy of tomorrow model basically tries to fix the major flaw of supply side economics by saying uh, it needs to be an equilibrium, a stable and steady cycle which produces a dynamic, innovation-driven, productivity-driven supply side, and steady demand. So how do you basically come into this new equilibrium? Uh, and how do you fix the flaws? Um, Let's go again into the details here. So basically, the, the, the growth drivers of the economy of tomorrow model would on the number one be, first of all, have stable foundations. Yeah? So stability and balance, equilibrium, would be one of the, the main pillars. Uh, it's get out of this volatility and crisis-prone models of financial capitalism and steady the ship. Number one, it has to do with inclusiveness, which is, of course, also social inclusiveness, but this is also where the demand comes in. So it cannot be an economy driven by a small percentage of the population, but the idea would be how do we make best use of the potential of 100% of the population. And number three, and I think that's key if we want to get out of this virtual simulated growth, Growth, real growth, has to be driven by innovation, has to be driven by innovation which introduces greater productivity into uh, the economy. So what should be done, and when I said should be done, I'm talking about the state policymakers, I'm talking about the private sector, but as well uh, the civil society, including academics such as yourselves, uh, well, there is a lot of strategic aims that have been identified by the Economy of Tomorrow project um, that would help to produce this kind of growth. Um, on the uh, innovation front, um, basically a recommendation is what we just say, look into the potential, what, what is you know, dubbed uh, the third industrial revolution. So the idea to say, let's decouple the use of resources and energy for everything that we do, housing, mobility, 
and production. Let's decouple that from the use of energy. That, I think, is the biggest project which is right now going on in Germany. We would like to replace uh, basically fossil fuel energy completely with renewables in the, in the course of one generation, which is a major task. Um, but uh, there have already been lots of progress has been done. More than 20% of the energy consumption in Germany is already based on uh, renewables today. Uh, so this would be one angle, is to say, introduce new markets, new jobs by creating new products, by creating innovative ways of using resources and, and, and uh, energy in order to do what we do, uh, which is inherently productivity driving. Um, sustainable growth, of course, has to do uh, with the necessity to switch off the volatility that stems from the financial markets. So we have to re-regulate the financial markets and put the financial uh, industry back uh, on, the, on the side seat. Um, basically, it has to have a service function uh, for the real economy and not the other way around. Um, it has to do with stable natural environments, but also a stable social environment. I think you in Thailand know exactly what I'm talking about. If you have political and social conflict, uh, development is, of course, a problem. Um, the global trade needs to be uh, balanced. We have to talk about fiscal sustainability, something social democrats don't like to talk so much. Uh, but nonetheless, we have to admit that's a problem. Um, but the socially just, uh, socially just growth um, may also be uh, interesting. Um, I've been here in Thailand for three years now. I've been uh, a witness of the uh, minimum wage debate that you had. found it quite interesting is the, um, how short-sighted that debate was actually driven. We're going to come to that in one second. But I mean, the question is, where do you create demand uh, if the export side is such a problem? How do you uh, create consumption demand domestically if you do not increase the wages? Yeah? And how do you compete if you don't increase the productivity? So fair incomes is not only a social thing, and that's what I usually tell my friends on the labor side, you cannot only argue from a moral perspective and say, this is what I need for my family. You have to argue from the economic side and basically say, um, what does that do to the demand side of an economy? That, I think, is the, the angle that we have to tackle that. I personally think that use of all talents is the most important one. I believe that every human being has talents, not the same ones, but I think that uh, what Amatya Zen would call uh, full capabilities for all, you know, so that we have all the job to do to free up the potential of every human being that lives in our society. That, I think, is the major driving force for a post-industrial society. Um, because producing, everyone can do that. Um, I think we have lots of producers in the world already. But if you go into the creative industries, what you call the knowledge-based economy, I think the use of talent, that's the real resource that we have to tackle. And I think all societies, West and East doing a pretty bad job at that right now. Now it's getting even more messy. I think we all agree that economics is already a problem, but we can discuss this uh, in a clean, on a green table. We can come up with great ideas. We can put that on a policy paper. We can hand it to the politicians and tell them we found the solution and then nothing happens. So the question is why? And I think uh, in Thailand that's uh, especially interesting because you have this kind of extra uh, than the other societies maybe don't have. Maybe the US does have it, but uh, at least in Europe we don't have this kind of populism debate, which really, like I said, one man's, uh, one man's populism is, I don't know, the other man's freedom fighter or something. Um, basically, what I'm saying is these debates is shadow boxing. These debates blur a real debate. These debates um, is the wrong angle to tackle the problems that we're in. They don't lead anywhere. However, it takes two to tango. And I think it also means that we, on the consultancy uh, side of things, have to understand that the world does not change according to facts and figures. The world changes according to political struggles. 
the outcome of any change that we see will have to happen in the political economy. We have to be clear on the fact that if we change structures, the way we do things, we tackle the interests of people. And there is a lot of people who basically control the resources, the financial resources, the means of production, the means of coercion, and even the ideology that have a huge interest that things stay the way they are. So these people, which I would call the status quo coalition, they want to uphold the status quo and they will do everything uh, to do it if they feel scared about the new. We come later to that, pro uh, that possibility to invite people to change if they see that in the tomorrow they also have a stake. But the natural reflex of those who benefit from the status quo is to say the status quo is supposed to stay just as it is. And then we don't have a problem of fact and figures, of awareness raising or creating understanding. Then we have a problem of a political power struggle. And the political power struggle can only be won by organizing political leverage for those who want change. I would argue if you come from the emancipatory side of things, who do not control the great resources in a society, this can only be done by bringing together what I call great rainbow coalition, broad societal coalitions. If you think about the great transformations in Asia, think about South Korea or Taiwan, think about Indonesia, uh, but also think about other examples. They have succeeded to a certain point because at some point there was a, a grand societal coalition that really brought together people from all sorts of sectors of society into basically on one platform. So the question is how do you create that and uh, basically what's necessary to do that. So that's basically what the Economy of Tomorrow project is aiming to do. It has a three-dimensional um, uh, strategy which thinks things from the very end. And this is the answer to the puzzle. We have so many great ideas, but none of them become reality. So how can we increase the potential for policy implementation? Uh, we don't want to have uh, research papers on the shelf. We want to see policy implemented on the ground. So that has to do with political will. And that the question becomes, how do you create political will? Well, one of the things can be done by academics, and that's one of the things I just presented. You can, of course, guide policy makings for those who have good intentions. We can debate about how many of them that would be, uh, but nonetheless, I would say there is people who have good intentions. Maybe they are confused about the problem, so proper analysis is needed, a compass is needed to give orientation, and that's what the economy of develop development model is doing, and this is what a great faculty, as the Faculty of Economics is also doing, is producing knowledge. But that's not enough. Basically, this can only be the very first step in order to do, produce two other things. Number one, what I call, what just call the, the rainbow coalition. The question is, what can be the platform where people who have different interests come together? Think about it. You have a factory that produces a lot of uh, emissions. Um, and uh, the environmentalists would probably say, close it. And the labor would say, keep it open. So where's, where's the common interest? You don't have it. Yeah? So where's the, the common platform between those who you just, on the green tail, would say, uh, labor, eco-coalition, that's it. Yeah? It's not happening. And that's not happening with many things in society, is that because we have different interests in the short run. So what is the platform that allows us to think beyond that and come together on a common platform for change? That has to be created. The economy of tomorrow model was always looking towards that. There was always, so to say, the task from the beginning when we developed that. The next one is a little bit more complicated, which has to do with changing the way how we perceive things. Um, of course, I already attacked the idea of the rational man, but I think um, in most situations of our life, we do not really think about things. We react in a default way. Um, and this default way you may call the mainstream, you may call discourse hegemony, uh, if you come from, uh, from the left. 
Um, but basically, it means that there is a default way how to perceive a situation, how we think about things, what we think is the truth, what we think is the right argument. And we, we feel these things because basically there is a mainstream in society that teaches us how that end. And this mainstream changes all the time. It changes not by facts and figures, but it changes um, basically by what I call discursive power. And this discursive power can be built. Um, so that's another important factor because this basically formats the political playing field. Example, let's, let's take again the minimum wage debate. Yeah? If that proposal would be forwarded, let's say, by the labor side, people would just dismiss miss it. They say, okay, first of all, it's labor, so we don't listen to you at all. Second of all, they would say it's bad economics. Third of all, they would say it, it hurts uh, competitiveness. So the political initiative is dead before it even reaches parliament. So the question is, how do you change that? Well, basically, what I said, you have to change the way people perceive things, introduce new arguments into the discourse, and change, basically, the, the major matrix of how we talk about things. So I have a, a nice quote for you. Um, this man is a little bit more fashionable now uh, than he used to be. Um, but basically, he says, and I really like that, um, I'm sure that the power of vested interest is vastly exaggerated compared with the graded encroachment of ideas. Um, so this is basically the idea that economists, by describing the world, give this kind of mainframe that makes us think about the world, and that will be the thing that basically people refer to when they make their decisions, even though they think they never read an economics book in their life. Politics and... Um, economics, as I said in the beginning, are intertwined, and I think the Euro crisis is a very good example. Look at the facts. I think the facts are not being um, challenged by anyone. Of course, you had the financial crisis. You had the bank bailouts of 2008-2009. Um, you have a, a serious recession uh, in Europe. And, uh, of course, that leads to a collapsing tax revenue. I think on that side, there's not much of a debate. But like I said, how do you interpret the facts? How do you understand the facts? And what does that mean for the policy outcome? That's politics. There is, of course, um, one discourse, we would say, so the sovereign debt that we see in European countries, let's take Spain, let's take Ireland, let's take Portugal, has to do with the bank bailouts. So we ba bailed out the banks, so the, the debt chewed up, and now we have a tax revenue problem, so see, that's the sovereign crisis. So they would say the problems come from the financial markets, regulate the financial markets. There is another discourse which basically said, see, this is the consequence for living beyond your means, for many, many years, because welfare states in Europe are just too fat and lazy. Huh? So you're living beyond your means for many years, and now you get the ticket for it. So what is the policy consequence? Slay down the welfare state. Um, what I'm saying is, number one, that the way how you interpret and describe the world already somehow predetermines what kind of policy response you want to see. And number two, who wins this debate wins the political game. And that was being won by the conservative side, again, of course. Um, so basically, right now, what we're doing with austerity, what we're doing with the Troika politics, is basically neoliberalism 2.0. We are slashing the welfare state. So not being able to win a policy debate like that predetermines what policymakers actually have to do. The room for maneuver for policymakers is very small especially in a crisis. So if it really comes down to do you bail out the bank and do you not bail out the bank, then the game is over anyway. But the, the battle starts way earlier. It starts when we define what is actually necessary and what's not. So policy making, politicians will intrinsically always be a little bit chaotic. And I know that many of you don't like that because it's not rational and it's been uh, portrayed as interest-driven, vested interest-driven, etc. 
Uh, but just have a realistic view of the world and just accept that as a fact, that politicians will always be ad hoc, they will always have their own interest in mind, and they will always act in their own best interest. So if we take that as the starting point, is it still possible to influence policy making in the long run? And the long run is what I say, let, let's take 10 years, 15 years, that's basically, I think it's not so easy to influence policy making in the short run. But in the long run, I think it's possible with, with, with a process that I call challenging, uh, channeling the political process, which is basically this three-dimensional uh, strategy of saying, there is a normative vision, this is your compass, this is where you want to be in 20 years, this is where you want to be in 10 years, and this is what you should do it. This is for the, those who have a good intention. But at the same time, you can tackle them by the calculus with how much can I get away with. Uh, and that means the creation of political leverage. That means you basically build up political cloud um, on, on, on the coalition side. So changing the political calculus of, of uh, policymakers is key. And what I just introduced, win the discourse battle. Win the way how we see the world, interpret the world, prescribe the world, because this will be the way how policymakers also see, describe, and interpret the world. So get into their heads. So this is basically the end product and also the end of my presentation here today. Um, it's a very complicated task. And as I said, things are very complex. So the first thing I think that needs to be done is we have to reduce complexity. Complexity is really here the enemy in the detail. Um, and this is what this, this matrix is basically doing. On the very right side, you see a vision which could be the platform for a coalition like that. A good society with full capabilities for all. It's basically Amartya Zen's thinking here. This is what your grandmother on the kitchen table understands. I think people have a very clear gut feeling about what's good and what's not. They cannot describe you exactly what has to be done, but they have a good feeling of what is a just society, what's a good society, and what's not. So this is important as a normative compass, a utopia, so to say. On the very left side, you have the governance tool. This is where experts like you come in. I mean, how many percent of a population can have an informed uh, uh, discussion if it's useful or not to regulate swap derivatives? Something like that. These are very complicated issues. Many of us don't understand them, certainly not me. Uh, but that means that there's only a couple of highly trained experts and technocrats who can actually discuss that. So how do we make a connection between this necessity to really understand issues on the left side and the necessity to move a, a society in the long run? Well, basically by putting it into the larger picture. So what you see here is a discourse matrix which enables you in only four steps to connect a highly technocratic technical debate to a normative vision for society at large and the other way around. If you want to have a good society with cool capabilities for all, you need to be able to produce socially just growth. If you want socially just growth, you will have to have a fair income for all because this is what drives the demand. If you want to have a fair income with all, you have to have to tackle the strategic aim of income equality and uh, be more inclusive with your institutions. And there is a couple of governments too who might just do that, and that could be, for instance, minimum wages. This is how you can structure the discourse and can tell the experts, the politicians, and the grandmother on the kitchen table how this all comes together. And this is where I would like to end my presentation because that's what I said in the very beginning. If you go back to the populism debate, you will always come to somehow a blockage uh, where it doesn't move forward anymore. Is that the one side says minimum wages are good, the other one said minimum wages are bad. All of them have their empirical facts. That's it. You know, you cannot decide anything. The citizens cannot decide, the media cannot decide, the policymakers cannot decide. We just sit there and listen to the economist. So the question is, for what and why do you want to do something? 
So this is the trajectory that gets you out of the present and gets you into the future, is to say, why would you have, want to have minimum wages? Well, because I would like to go down that path. And then you can have an informed debate. You can discuss objectives and the way how to get there. And I think then the argumentative table is open. That's what we call deliberation. But only if you put it in the larger picture, then you can have criteria and benchmarks which allow you to say we're going in the right direction or in the wrong direction. I think this symposium here today is exactly doing that. I think we have a couple of very interesting uh, inputs and, and discussions coming up. And uh, I think there will be an extreme knowledge of details on the table here. But I think in order to make sense of all of that, you will have to ask yourself the question, where we, do we want to go with that? Is this helpful or not? And if you want to answer that question, at some point you will leave the steady firm ground of neutral knowledge and you will go into the fluffy puffy uh, world of normative visions, values and politics. This is how it works. There cannot be any other compass. So basically that's my suggestion for that. Um, I thank you for listening to me for so long and uh, Kopkul Markup.